So I'm the, I'm the oldest of your 18-year-olds today. <laughs> it's wonderful to be so young. So um, what's the most dangerous thing you can do in your life? One of them is to be a 16-year-old and be on this stage, right? The other most fundamental thing that is the most dangerous thing you can do in your life throughout history is a word. And the word is why, right? To ask a question is so dangerous because it does the one thing that your brain hates, which is to step into uncertainty, right? Our brain hates uncertainty. If you're not sure that's a predator, it was too late, right? So we evolved to take what is uncertain and make it certain. Right? Seasickness is a consequence of uncertainty, right? Because to not know was to die, right? And dying is easy, okay? So the irony is that that one place that we actually evolve to avoid uncertainty is the only place we can go if we're going to discover, to step into the dark, right? To step into uncertainty. But how can we do that, if that's the thing that we actually try to avoid? Well, there's only one place where uncertainty is actually a good thing, right? Think in your life, what is the one thing where you actually love uncertainty? It's not that it's tolerated, you love it, right? Evolution gave us a solution. Can you think of what it is? It's four, four letters. It's play, right? Play is evolution's solution to uncertainty, right? So. What is play? For those people who study play, experts in play, Isabel Banky, who was presenting earlier, is an expert in play, right? She'll tell you that it celebrates uncertainty. It all actually is how we create uncertainty, encourages diversity. It's open to possibility, right? It's also inherently cooperative, and it's intrinsically motivated. In other words, we play in order to play. Almost everything you do in the world, you do for another reason. The reason, the reward for play is play. Right? And if we add intention to play, what do you get? You get science. Science is not a method. Science is a way of being, right? which is play with intention. So what happens if you think about science in this new way? If you add rules to play, you have a game, which is actually an experiment. So if we reframe science in this way, what can we achieve? And because science is about stepping into certainty, probably one of the most important characteristics of science is courage. And all the young people who have come up have not come up with confidence, they've come up with courage. And that's fundamental to education. So I want to introduce someone who is now, and she and her class were the youngest published scientists in the world at eight to 10 years old. And Amy became the youngest TED speaker when we spoke about six years ago. Okay, so she's gonna tell you the story of the Black Alton Bee Project. So Amy, can you come on up? Hola, mi amo Amy. Tengo 17 años, amo las ciencias, y estoy muy feliz de estar aquí hoy. Pero mi español es muy mal, so I'll continue in English. <laughs> also, since I'm English, it's a great pleasure to be doing this in front of your Royal Highness, so thank you. Why aren't more girls choosing to take science or STEM subjects? What is it about the way that we're taught that makes these subjects so unattractive to girls? Well, I can't say for certain why this is, what I can say is that the current teaching methods do not seem to be inspiring or attracting very many girls. I'm currently studying towards my A-levels in England, and through this, I chose to take physics as one of my options. And through this, I'm witnessing firsthand how many girls are choosing to take other options. But what is science? Well, science can be defined as the study of the natural world through observation and experiments. The key words here being observation and experiments. Hands-on, finding our own paths, our own discoveries. Definitely not repeating a textbook in an exam or following the instructions to complete a so-called experiment. For my GCSEs, I chose to take all three sciences along with history and other subjects. 
I remember one day sitting in my classroom and learning about Ian Fleming's discovery of penicillin in my history lesson. Then, the same day, I covered the same topic in my chemistry lesson. My science lessons were crossing over with my history lessons. Do we really expect future scientists to revisit historical events instead of moving forward, finding new paths, new discoveries? Science allows us to evolve. Science applies to anything innovative, and the world is constantly changing and evolving, and we need to evolve with it. So science allows us to evolve. So why are we still teaching children the same lessons we're teaching them in history? Is there a point to science if we're teaching the next generation of Mary Curies, Albert Einsteins, Rosalind Franklins, history instead of allowing them to experiment and potentially discover something new? So, if I'm so uninspired by science and the way that it's taught, why do I love the subject? Well, let me introduce to you what inspired me. On the 23rd of December, 2010, a paper appeared in the Royal Society Journal, Biology Letters. Just a normal occurrence in the scientific world, except this one wasn't. This paper was written by 25 7 to 10 year olds. The paper challenged previously conceived ideas and did so in a way that had never been done before, not even by adults. Not only that, I was lucky enough to be one of the children involved in the project. I remember when I was about seven years old, sitting in the classroom, when our then head teacher came in and asked if we wanted to train bees, yes, bees, to play a game. Well, our minds went into overdrive for our imaginations. As you can imagine, the boys wanted to teach them how to play a game of football, and the girls wanted to teach them a dance routine. After that, we introduced to Dr. Bo Lotto, an inspirational neuroscientist who showed me his bee matrix and explained how play can be a brilliant source of learning. Play becomes a game, he said and a game develops rules. And after all, isn't that what an experiment is? A game with the added fun of rules. After all, both experiments and games have no predicted outcome. So with that in mind, we asked what if bees could ever possibly think like humans, like us? Which is amazing since they only have one million brain cells compared to our 100 billion. So how do we answer this what if question? Well, we played a game, of course, to see if bees could ever possibly think like us. So we got out our pencils and devised a game for the bees. After that, we looked around the school and decided to replicate our game on the preschool children. We hid sweets under different colored cups in the playground and organized the cups into different colors and patterns. To solve the puzzle, the children had to identify the correct combination of colors and patterns. Only then did they get the reward. We played the exact same color pattern game on the bees, except this time they were rewarded with a sugary solution. To solve the puzzle, the bees had to go to the yellow flowers, if the yellow flowers were surrounded by the blue, and equally, if the blue flowers were surrounded by the yellow. So we played our game for a few weeks and noted all our findings. When we wrote the paper, we did so in our own way. Our story begins once upon a time. All our diagrams are drawn in wax crayon, and one line even reads, we put the bees in the fridge and made bee pie smiley face. We were kids, it works. By giving us the space and, our own, and leaving us to our own devices, Bo showed me that not all learning has to be done from behind a desk in a classroom. We have so much space, so many resources in our world, that given the, opportunity, we can create opportunity, given the chance, we can create opportunity and excitement anywhere. So why don't we? Now, it doesn't have to be a groundbreaking experiment, though. This way of learning can be adapted to suit any task, any lesson, any subject. Let's take baking a cake, for example. Now, as a student, if I were to be given this recipe and asked to make this cake by a teacher, then I could do it easily, without having to think about what I need to do in order to make this cake. However, if we remove the recipe and, let's say, replace it with a picture, I now have to start thinking, right, what ingredients do I need? Obviously, I need eggs, flour, sugar, butter, cocoa powder, but how much of each ingredient do I actually need? Can you see that I'm now having to think about what I need to do in order to finish my task? This type of learning engages a student and makes them look at a subject in a completely new and exciting way. This has changed from a simple following the recipe to having to think about the steps I need to take in order to create this cake. But you probably sat there thinking, how does baking a cake help us inspire our children? Well, currently we're taught in a similar way. We're given the recipe, expected to memorize the recipe, then, write down in an exam everything we remember. In science, we're given the method of how to find the potential difference across a circuit, for example. 
Then, by the end of the lesson, we're expected to know how to apply this method to every scenario the example can come up with. As you can see, this leaves little room for the, the student to think, why am I learning this? Or to come up with their own method to finding the solution. As Einstein said, education is not the learning of facts, but of the training of the mind to think. And isn't that what we should be taught? To think for ourselves, to find our own paths, our own solutions, to find new discoveries. Thank you. Absolutely brilliant, very inspirational. So we've actually evolved this into what we call the iScientist program, which starts with, with, has this sort of sequence to it. And the first step in teaching children about science or indeed anything is wonder. Because if you don't care, you're not gonna ask a question, right? And that's the first thing we try to do when we work with, pe with not just young people, anyone. Right? The next step is why. And I should add, tell you that when we tried to get funding for this project, we were rejected. Because the scientists said young people couldn't make an original contribution to science, and the teacher said it was just too difficult. Right? So we did it anyway. And I should say that the questions that the children asked were actually novel, not just to themselves, but to science in general. You then start with what if? What if I do this? What if I do that? And then, wow, wow is the observation, it's the discovery. And then finally, you have the who cares, which is the sharing of the observation, which becomes the wonder for the next cycle. Okay? And we can apply this to any learning system, as Amy was saying. So who cares, right? Well, the fact is that current education focuses on one side of innovation. Innovation has two sides. There's creativity and efficiency. And education focuses on the efficiency side. Why? Because so much of our businesses, our world, also wants efficiency. The best environment for efficiency is competition. That's exactly the opposite you want for creativity. Right? So I'm suggesting that we're really, and the other problem is, just consider the fact that the top 10 in-demand jobs in 2010, they didn't actually exist in 2004. Right? It's not that they were there, they just weren't as popular. They weren't even present. So we're educating young people for a world that doesn't even exist yet, using technologies that don't even exist. So really what we should be teaching children is to have a better balance between creative and efficiency. And I'm not saying you should have just one or the other, because if a bus is coming at you, you don't want to say, oh, I wonder if there's a different way I could see this. Right? You want to get out of the way really fast. Right? But we live life as if everything's a bus. And so wisdom is knowing how to move between. And in fact, that agility of thought is what we should be teaching children. And in, in fact, teaching everybody, right? How to become adaptable. The most successful systems in nature are the most adaptable, okay? So I also just want to finish with, um, Amy and I talked about this earlier, so you can come on up, come on up. Um, Amy was recently told that um, uh, you um, have dyslexia. Yeah. <laughs> yes? Quite profoundly, right? And she's struggling in science class, right? I find this to be an incredible irony. How can someone with dyslexia struggle in a science class and yet be the youngest published scientist in the world? Right? That's an indictment of the system, not of the people. So we're just gonna finish with an illusion to show you how fundamental it is you can change your perceptions by just changing your assumptions. I want you to notice that you see this diamond spinning from left to right, yes? Keep looking at it, and the reason is because your brain assumes you're looking down on that surface. I want you to imagine looking up at it, and suddenly it will go in the opposite direction. How many can get it to flip? Yes? By simply changing your biases, you can fundamentally change what you see. So. I can't get it to flip. Thank you very much. I hope that Muchas was Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, yes. Yeah, Espanol.